concerned with is that top layer, the O layer. That's O for organic. And that is the area that has essentially your organic matter in it. That's technically not soil. It's actually the layer above that. And so you have the, the A horizon, and that is where, that's like what you would call your topsoil. And that is the most dynamic part of the soil. And that is um, kind of the, what has evolved from what's below it. And so B horizon is essentially your base layer. That is what feeds into to create the topsoil that is above it through multiple actions that happen on it. In general, that's weathering processes uh, through rain, time, heat, all of that um, topography and you have vegetation, roots growing through it and all that slowly uh, change that layer and create the topsoil. But it happens over a long, long period of time. And then C is essentially the bedrock. That is what would be known as the parent material. So soil, when we talk about it as a unit, we don't just necessarily mean the parts of it as the hard, okay, I picked up this very heavy bunch of soil. Soil actually okay. consists of kind of a ratio. Okay, hold on. Is that better? Can yes. you see something now? Oh, okay. good. He's now we can see it. Sorry All right. about that. No, 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 it's okay. Let me just go back to show you this uh, previous slide if I can get that. So this is what I was talking about. So this is essentially what is a pedon, is the layers, you have the organic matter at the top, your A horizon, B horizon, and C horizon. And then this is what you're looking at to be an ideal soil. An ideal soil has your mineral component, which is the sand, silt, and clay component that makes up that. But it is not a solid object. Soil has it has por is a porous medium, so it has space in it. And in that space, you generally want about a 50-50 split between water and air. Because if it's all water, this half of that porous was filled with water, you would have drowned plants and they would die because they're waterlogged. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if there were no water in it at all, the soil would be completely dry and your plants would die because they didn't have any water. And so you generally are trying to get the ideal balance of 50-50 of airspace and water within the pore spaces of soil. And lastly, what also makes up healthy soil is to have some organic matter in there because the organic matter really helps to feed the nutrients of the soil. Although there is nutrients in the soil itself, the actual um, clay or mineral components. So in looking at soil as kind of when you say, well, I have a heavy clay soil or I have a really sandy soil, helps to kind of understand that each of those have a specific size of the particle when you're talking about whether you have sand, silt, or clay. And this is kind of a representative conceptual diagram of the relativeness of a clay particle being very small to a silt to sand. And if you think of it as a beach ball, a golf ball, and some teeny little, uh, we'll call it a pellet for like uh, a BB gun, that if you were to first put in the beach balls, you could get the silt and that would fill in around it because you'd have space around it. And then you could get a whole lot of the little BBs around it as well. <laughs> But if you put just the clay in there first, you wouldn't be able to get any of the other two in because the clay would be all packed together. Um, and so having a mix, an ideal soil generally has a good balance of about 30% or 33% of each of these because it allows for a lot more pore space, which allows for a lot more of holding of water, but also allowing if you have a heavy rain for that water to infiltrate and get in through that soil so it doesn't stand you have a lot of clay, you have very little pore space to allow 
for that water to get through, which is why heavy clay soils don't allow water to drain out of them very well. And the other component that's really important to understand is how the, the cycles affect that soil and what's going on in the nutrient dynamics. And so you have a carbon cycle, you have your water cycle, and then you have your nutrient cycle. I'm just gonna briefly talk about them. The carbon cycle, which is kind of all the in the news right now because of climate change, right? We have carbon in the atmosphere, it is increasing. Well, it is a cycle, it goes around and around and we have this carbon sequestration that everyone's talking about. Well, if we just grow trees, that'll pull down the carbon from the atmosphere because photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide, puts it into a carbon-based organism. It makes itself out of carbon. So it utilizes that carbon through photosynthesis, puts it into its leaves, it's like in the case of a tree, into its trunk, and even more importantly, down into the root system. And that carbon cycle actually helps to feed the organisms that are within the soil because they just like sugar, just like everybody else. And so they want more of it. Um, so part of this leads into the reason why cover crops are so good to help soil for multiple reasons. But one of the other ones is you're feeding the biota by giving them something to eat, which allows them to then not only eat that carbon, but also they need other or, um, nutrients as well, just like a plant does. But when they die, they release those nutrients for the plant to take up. So the water cycle is also very dynamic. You know, you get rainfall, but then that plant transpires that water, which also helps to put that water back into the air. This helps to clean the water, but also this is a really important component to make sure that there is moisture constantly going down into the soil. And that soil not only evaporates, I mean, the water not only evaporates from the soil, but it transpires from the soil. And so if you have a really hot day like we've been having, I'm in North Carolina, but you guys are, I know, having the same heat wave up there in, in New England. Um, those plants are using a ton of water. Um, and mostly to cool themselves off through evaporative cooling. So when it's a really hot day, a plant may use a whole lot more water and it doesn't even use it necessarily for putting it into its own yield. It's just kind of doing it because it needs to cool itself off. Um, but it's really important also to understand that the organisms in the soil also need that water just as much as the plants that are growing in that. And so the water regulates how active your soil er organisms are in that if it's dry, organisms just like plants aren't doing a whole lot. And so even if it's ideally warm and you could get a lot of activity, if your soil is dry, you will not get a lot of activity from your soil biota. Therefore, you will not get a lot of nutrients. So even if, you, if it's been dry and then you water, uh, you won't get as many nutrients available to the plants as you would if it was a nice, idyllic, consistently moist condition. So lastly is the nutrient cycle, which is super dynamic, but essentially it's just boiling down to the fact that the nutrients are made available through the biota that live in the soil. I mean, you, you can put some organic or some nutrients on the soil but in generally if the organisms that live in the soil need those nutrients they can take that up possibly before the plant does and so by having a healthy biota that's already fed well allows more nutrients to be available for the plants when those plants need it and keeping that balance between the soil biota, which really is what makes the nutrients available to um, the plants. But also minerals that are trapped within the soil are slowly being released, kind of like um, they're there waiting for the organisms to either what's called chelate, which is that a, say a fungi will emit an enzyme and by emitting that enzyme it allows it to kind of erode away 
some of the nutrients from a mineral, which are really kind of tightly locked and a plant can't get it. Plants can only take up nutrients that are in the soluble form. So they're dissolved in water and they allow that then it goes up into the plant. But organisms that are in the soil, like our mycorrhiza fungi that a lot of people mm -hmm. are um, really starting to kind of understand more and more of, they help to release those nutrients that are kind of bound onto the minerals or part of the mineral structure um, and allow them to be released to the plants. And so I've been talking a lot about these little guys living in the soil, we call them the microbiota, but it's really a dynamic relationship between the organic matter that's there, that's kind of the food source, the soil organisms, organisms that are there, and that they continually cycle this back and forth. They're eating the organic matter, taking that and breaking it apart into its component parts, the basic building blocks of that organic matter, and all of the individual nitrogen, sulfur, carbon bonds, and all the other um, chemical um, ions that make up that organic matter, which is very complex. It takes a long time to break down. The organisms break it down. By them kind of consuming that, they take that into their own body, but like bacteria that are in the soil and fungi are very short-lived. And so they die and then they release those nutrients into the soil. And so we say that soil is made up of, or organic matter is made up of the living, the dead, and the very dead. But the, mm. that is a part of the uh, soil itself. So what are all the things that kind of work in this soil food web? Well, there's a lot. You have the earthworms, which are kind of a more of a macro um, fauna and they may consume leaves and things like that. They munch it up, they make it into, break it into a smaller particle that then is excreted. And in that excretion, you may have some nematodes, protozoa, or arthropods, or fungi that then can now take in that nutrient. And they continue to cycle it down through each of them. And they all rely on each other, they also, are predators of each other as well, but they all work in tandem to essentially feed the soil in the long run. And it's what allows all those nutrients to be available to plants. And so when you look at this cycle, which is, is a lot going on, you have your crop, which is of your main concern, which will have some crop residue at the end of the season that decomposes that becomes humus and immobilization just means that um, an easy way to talk about immobilization is you, you've probably heard that, you know, you want a 30 to one carbon ratio with your compost and you should never generally mulch with like shavings or sawdust because it has too high of a carbon to nitrogen ratio. Well, the reason for that is that organisms need about 20 to 30 parts of carbon to every part of nitrogen. And so if you have not a lot of nitrogen compared to the amount of carbon, the little guys are there just munching away at carbon, totally binging on the sugar, waiting <laughs> until they can get to one nitrogen so they can reproduce. So they eat carbon to basically stay active and stay stasis, but what they really want to do is reproduce. And so they're waiting around and trying to get to the nitrogen. And so if you have too much carbon, you essentially immobilize the nitrogen because those organisms are getting it and it's not available to anything else. So then after immobilization, it can get broken down into the proteins and polysaccharides. These are essentially those really stable parts of the organic matter that are around for a long time that really help to feed the soil. And what we now know when we do a lot of soil health measurements is pr the protein and polysaccharide measurement gives you an idea of how healthy your soil is because that essentially makes up the part of the, the dead biota and the other genetics that are in there. The bacteria, the fungi, and other microbiota that are there. 
So mineralization is when the organisms allow or make available those nutrients to be into the soil solution. They get mineralized, then now they're a nutrient that can be taken up by your crop. And so this is essentially the cycle of nutrients within the soil. But there's some things going on here. You have oxygen up here in this corner. That is required by the soil biota because like us, they need oxygen. Although plants also need oxygen as well as carbon dioxide. But they just need it more. Like we need oxygen more, not carbon. When they get oxygen, like in your soil, if it's not waterlogged, it's aerobic conditions. So your soil biota functions really well. It decomposes and it allows some of those parts to be available and released. So they need water for this and carbon dioxide. So they're taking in a lot of these nutrients, but they are also releasing carbon dioxide by their respiration, just like we respire. And those plants can use up that carbon dioxide. They also need water. So these are kind of essential building blocks that are there to make all this happen. That can go to the crops. And then the nutrients are also required by the soil biota. And so they help kind of drive this part here that makes the nutrients available to the crops that become the residue that get decomposed by the soil biota. And then over here, this right here, the proteins and polysaccharides become part of that soil structure. They're kind of like the sticky glue that holds the aggregates together. If you have ever kind of dug up a shovel full of soil and it's a little dry, you have these clumps. Well, those clumps are actually made up of a whole bunch of little pieces that are in there and that those clumps are held together by what's essentially excreted from and the, the mycelium from fungi and, and other excrements from say uh, uh, the bacteria. And in that aggregate, there are all these little pore spaces, which is what makes a soil so healthy. And some recent research in looking at what is the one, the number one thing for soil health, what's the number one measurement that correlated to higher yields and what we call healthy soil, which is a very loose term, was soil aggregates. And so if you're out tilling your soil, like I know my mother used to do it, every time there was a weed, she was tilling it. Every time you till the soil, you disturb those aggregates. And those aggregates are like little homes for all of your little microbiota. The little bacteria can hide in there and all the other things can hide in there away from the bigger macrofauna. And so if you kind of grind that all up, you've now just basically destroyed the part that helps allow your nutrients to be available, or at least set that back by reducing their numbers. And so maintaining that soil health helps to maintain nutrient cycling. So I had mentioned before that plants can only take up nutrients in the soil solution. And so that just means that it's dissolved in water. And so you have the root hairs and of a plant, the only part that can take up generally, um, the nutrients are the root hairs. Those are the active growing parts that actually have pores. They haven't been sealed off yet. They have these little root hairs. They allow those nutrients to go up into the plant, and be taken up into the um, xylem and phloem, and then dispersed to the rest of the plant. So in general, in the soil solution, most of the nutrients are positively charged that stay within this. Um, and they can easily go from these clay particles over to the, uh, the root hairs in general through um, kind of osmotic potential. And these are readily available, but of course, nitrogen and other um, nutrients are also available within that soil solution. But because they're positively charged, they can be held onto a clay particle a little bit easier because in general, clay particles have negative charges on them and positive charges are kind of attracted to negative charges. So from that soil solution, the plant 
can access those nutrients. But depending on the type of nutrient, they are either more mobile or very much less mobile in the case of phosphorus for the plant to take up. So there are three different ways that a plant can take up these nutrients. The first one is diffusion, the second one is mass flow, and the last one is root interception. So if you can think of, there's kind of two zones of absorption or the ability of the nutrients to move through that soil to get to the plant, you have the large absorption zone and the small absorption zone. So depending on the nutrient, they are either very mobile, where they can easily get from kind of out here over into here with a plant, or they are immobile nutrients where they need to be much closer to that root zone in order to be taken up by the plant. And if you notice here, these are actually negatively charged meaning they are easily leached out of the soil because they are not easily attracted to um, the soil particles. Generally, organic matter tends to be um, positively charged, although, I mean, negatively charged. But there are some parts that do have a positive charge and can hold on to some of these nutrients, which is why having organic matter is really important. And if you notice here, nitrate is that that one we're all wor worried about because you add nitrogen and it rains, where does it go? It leaches out. Why? Because that is the generally the number one form of nitrogen in the soil. Um, although there is an, there's another form of it and that's called ammonium. So that's the reason why nitrogen easily ends up into our waterways and down and creating dead zones because it is one, the nutrient that plants need in the highest amount um, of the nutrients, and it is easily leached, so it's not easily there. So I'm gonna kind of break down the three different ways that um, plants can uptake that. So diffusion is where it, it essentially is just a, a concentration gradient. So the plant creates that concentration gradient by utilizing um, kind of a, nutrient on the inside by it using that up it creates a gradient so something wants to go from a point of the higher concentration on the outside of the plant root to a area of lower concentration and so for you new englanders who use a lot of salt now i'm from new england so i'm very aware uh, many maple trees along those highways and roads are dying when you don't have a lot of water and rainfall in the spring, you put a lot of salt on the roads, it doesn't wash out uh, that salt. And so unfortunately, part of the reason why those maple trees are dying is because there's too much salt on the outside compared to the salt on the inside. The plant can't take up water because the concentration gradient is too high on the inside of the plant versus the outside of the plant. So reverse is much better having more water on the inside, having less water in that concentration on the outside allows those nutrients to diffuse into the plant, plant can take it up. So the next one is mass flow. And this is just as that plant is using the water, it's sucking up some other nutrients along with it. And and a lot of this has to do with um, happening from transpiration. So it basically creates a vacuum. It's creating a vacuum and it's just kind of sucking at the water and along with it, those other nutrients are flowing. And the last one, which is what uh, kind of still hasn't been solved on how do we deal with this um, because of phosphorus is root interception. Phosphorus is the one nutrient that really does not move very well in soil. It doesn't move hardly at all. And so the root has to grow to it and essentially intercept that phosphorus right where it is, very near to the particle that it was um, kind of com coming off from. One of the ways that we can help phosphorus get to the plants is to curate a good biota because the mycorrhizal fungi have a good relationship. They kind of say, hey, you know, plant, if you give me a little bit of carbon, 
I'll give you some phosphorus because I can get phosphorus and I can bring it over to you. All I want in exchange is a little bit of sugar. Now that is a cost to the plant because the plant does have to create that carbon from the atmosphere. And so studies have shown like large studies in soybean and things that you have this symbiotic relationship with even the rhizobacteria, which is a similar situation where they want the carbon in exchange for getting the nitrogen at the expense of some yield, essentially. But I would argue that you're going to get a whole lot more yield if your plant is able to access nutrients like phosphorus. And they have also shown now recently that mycorrhizal can help to get both nitrogen, but also potassium. So those three big uh, nutrients that are needed in the most quantity for the plant, the mycorrhizal and other symbiosis type organisms can help the plant, but only if you're fostering an environment where those mycorrhizae can function. And so when you're looking at nutrients and everyone's like, well, I see some, you know, I did a tissue test. My tissue test says I'm low in nitrogen. So I'm going to add nitrogen. But if it is not the thing that is most limiting, no matter how much nitrogen you add, you will not increase your yields by much because it is not the most limiting nutrient. And so if you think of it as a barrel, it is the law of the most limiting nutrient. So you have to address the one that is most limiting first. And if it is water, or maybe it is something that is a micronutrient like boron, that needs to be addressed first before any of those other nutrients are really gonna make a difference. Um, and in the case of nitrogen, yes, you may get some growth, but maybe at uh, you won't get if in the case of uh, a fruiting organism or a fruiting plant like peppers and tomatoes, well, maybe you just don't get that much fruit, but you get a heck of a lot of top growth. And so understanding the nutrient balance within the plants and also what is there available in the soil and making sure that you have ample available for the plant, but also understanding that it is not just about making sure you add, well, my plant needs 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, I'm gonna add that. Um, if you don't address something that is maybe much smaller and you don't need much of it, but it's not there and available, then your plant's just kind of spinning its wheels. And so there's a lot of acronyms. Most of you probably understand MPK, that's nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. But are those the ones that are really limiting growth? Not always, but most of the time, if you have a fairly healthy soil, because these are removed at the highest rate from soil and nitrogen generally can easily leach. And so I had mentioned before that nitrogen is in two forms in the soil that are available to the plant. That's both nitrate and ammonium. Ammonium is actually positively charged. So that can be held on by the soil uh, clay, because that's a negatively charged, it's attracted to that. Unfortunately, nitrogen has nine different forms. And those persnickety little organisms in there, if there's nitrogen fixing bacteria of multiple kinds, nitrogen is extremely dynamic. And it, if you have nitrosomus in there, they might say, oh, cool, ammonium. I was looking for that today. I'm going to make that into nitrate. And so now it is taken one nitrogen off because it's NH4. Now you have NO3. So you have, it used one, and now you have nitrate that can easily leach. Which is to say that if you have it in organic matter, that nitrogen is in what's called an organic form. So nit ammonium, NH4, um, and nitrate, NO3, are what's called inorganic. When it's organic, it's in a living organism or a recently dead organism. And so by having that cover crop that's there slowly decomposing, you now have a steady source that you have a readily available to go 
burst into ammonium. That's the first form that um, the bacteria will, or other organisms will uh, turn that into from breaking down organic matter, goes into ammonium. That can easily be taken up to the plant by the plant if those plants are actively growing before it gets into the nitrate form. But if you have actively growing plants and it is in the nitrate form, it will be taken up by the plant before it leaches. The worst thing to do is have decomposing organic matter and you've added some manure in the fall with no crop or crop to take it up, it will eventually become either a leachable form of nitrogen or something that we call volatizes, uh, which is ammonia or uh, nitrous oxide that then goes into the atmosphere and that's even worse. So understanding that living things help to hold on to that nitrogen and make that available for your, uh, for your plants, as well as phosphorus. Although so phosphorus actually is one of those that you can have a whole lot of phosphorus in the soil. And down in South, Carol or in South and North Carolina, because we have a lot of animal um, CAFOs or feeding operations. I mean, there's these huge pork and chicken farms everywhere, unfortunately. They have a lot of manure that they need to do something with, so they say, hey, farmer, or some of them actually do both. They, they're poultry farmers as well as growing corn and soybeans. They'll take the manure and they put it on their fields. Well, chicken manure especially has a really high phosphorus content, and so our fields now have so much phosphorus in them. Unfortunately, though, phosphorus can be locked up in the soil, and so it can be there and not be available to the plants, unless you have the mycorrhizal that'll help easily make that available. And so even if you have a lot from a soil test, it actually has more to do with um, other things that you can do to manage that availability of the phosphorus. So cation exchange capacity or CEC, uh, that essentially just means the ability for your soil by a measurement for it to exchange positively charged, which is known as a cation, um, within the soil. So basically, how negatively charged is my soil and how much positively charged things is it going to hold on to? There's also another one, anion exchange capacity. It's essentially the opposite. It means how much positive charge is in my soil. That will help hold on to things like negatively charged nitrate. And then pH, super, super important. The pH of the soil is essentially just how many hydrogen molecules in a concentration do I have within my soil solution? That's all P percent hydrogen. That's what pH stands for. And the reason why you're concerned with that is because the more hydrogen that is in your soil solution and not on your clay particles and other uh, negatively charged sites, in general, means that those negatively charged sites can hold on to things like calcium and magnesium. And so here are kind of the two basic forms of the general nutrients that you want to make available to your plants that generally they need in the most. I mean, there's some other ones like selenium and some very minor micronutrients that as long as your soil is pretty healthy and has a, um, a fairly good topsoil, uh, those would be available. They need to be a much smaller quantity. Um, so you have calcium, magnesium, potassium, and nitrogen, this form here, and positive charge. Those would be held on as in the cation, ex or in the anion exchange capacity. These are cations. As well as these micronutrients here, zinc, copper, iron, manganese, and nickel. The anions will be the ones that can easily leach in water. And so that's nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Now phosphorus, like nitrogen, has multiple forms. And so this right here is the form that would be available in a soil solution. However, um, phosphorus takes on forms that do get kind of uh, uh, what's called adsorbed to clay particles. And so they get held on very tightly uh, and generally don't easily come off um, unless say a, micro, a mycorrhizal fungi or some other uh, organism is able to kind of kick it off or chelate it off. And then sulfur, uh, which generally tends to leach down to the subsurface. It doesn't leach all the way into the waterways like nitrogen. It doesn't leach as quickly. Um, and sulfur used to not be a problem. No one ever thought about sulfur much because 
we had these power plants that were spewing out sulfur like crazy. Um, and so in general, we had what's called sulfur, de sulfur deposition. It came out of the sky, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, but now we are seeing that there are starting to be sulfur deficiencies because we've cleaned up those power plants. We've reduced the amount of sulfur coming out of the atmosphere. And so sulfur is one of the six macronutrients. And so some, my research actually focuses on looking at things limiting corn nutrients. And that was the one nutrient that seemed to be most limiting to our corn growers in um, North Carolina. And so uh, good to get a toil test to understand where your sulfur is um, and also do some tissue testing to make sure that it's available. But one of the other things about sulfur is um, in general, it is in, used by the plant to make protein for a few other things, but mostly for protein. Now the other things that's used to make those amino acids what are the building blocks of protein is nitrogen. And so there is an ideal called nitrogen to sulfur ratio that you would want to have in balance. And generally that's about 15 to one. And so if in fact you don't have very much nitrogen in your soil, but you have a whole bunch of nitrogen the sulfur can be limiting to the plant using the nitrogen because similar to the, the carbon nitrogen example, what the plant does is it takes up nitrogen, what's called luxury consumption. It takes it up whether it needs it or not. If it's there, that plant's saying, I'm going to hold on to it. It actually holds on to it in the vacuoles until it needs it as a building block. And so it's waiting around for sulfur so it can then create that protein. So if you don't have enough sulfur, but you've applied plenty of nitrogen, you may not get the result you anticipate because that sulfur is inhibiting the ability of that protein to be um, synthesized within the plant. So this right here is kind of focusing just on pH, and this is why pH is so important to get that balance right is if you have a high amount of hydrogen within your soil solution, great, you have a bunch of negatively charged um, sites on your clay, so you can hold on to a lot of uh, positively charged ions, which is awesome, but too much of it can be really bad and can be very toxic. On the other side, if it's too acidic, what you end up with is that hydrogen being out of solution and actually on the clay particles, taking up all the sites, not being able to hold on to the other positively charged uh, nutrients. And so this is kind of the sweet spot. In general, you're going to about 5.5, 5.7 through about 6.8. It's kind of the ideal. And the reason why this is ideal is you can kind of see from these bars it is generally where most of the nutrients are most available. And so these sliding kind of how they get thinner down here and fatter over here shows either where they're fatter, that's where they're more available and where it's thinner and they're less available. And so of course, this does depend on a crop you're growing. If you're growing blueberries, don't go by this. They generally like 4.5, they like acidic soil. So obviously knowing the tolerance of the crop that you're growing is very important. But the reason why most generally the, the main staple crops like tomatoes and cucumbers and all of those kind of vegetable crops that we grow want you, they say you need a pH around six is because that is where most of those nutrients are available. And it is also the other reason is anything that is above 5.5 Aluminum is in a form that is held in the soil and not being able to be taken up by the plant. And so you also reduce things like aluminum toxicity um, and other toxicities of other um, heavy metals as well. And so with a pH below 5.5, aluminum as well as hydrogen are in, high in the soil solution. So as you raise that pH up, aluminum and hydrogen are no longer a, a problem. So kind of the last thing when talking about nutrient balance is this crazy chart here by Mulders 
which is the antagonistic and synergistic relationship between nutrients. So as no man is an island, neither is a nutrient. So they are not working there by themselves. So this chart, and you can easily find this, on, this online as, as well, if you were to look at just typing in antagonistic relationship, you can see how they're all really connected. And so in the direction at which the arrow is going, shows the effect one nutrient may have on the other. So the green are the antagonistic relationship. And one key antagonistic relationship is phosphorus with magnesium here. So if you have a lot of potassium in your soil, and potassium is one that the plant needs a lot of it, but the plant also will just take it up in luxury consumption if it's available and around. It also needs magnesium. Both of them are what's called um, uh, a, they're both cations and I just lost the word I was thinking of. So it's late and I have, I have been in, I'm literally a week away from finishing my dissertation. So my brain is about ready to explode. Um, so pardon me for that. Um, so essentially the research shows that there's kind of an ideal ratio, but if you have, maybe you have magnesium available, you did a soil test and the soil test says, I have enough magnesium available in my soil, but I'm growing something and I want these killer tomatoes and I'm going to add three times as much potassium as they need because I want to beat my neighbor and I want the sweetest, best tomatoes and I know they like potassium and I don't want any yellow shoulder, so I'm going to add potassium. Problem is, is that that plant will luxury consume that potassium. And if the ratio of the potassium to magnesium is out of balance, meaning there's way more potassium than there's magnesium, there's only so many highways into the plant. And there's only so much that's going in through that mass flow. Well, if there's higher concentration of potassium to magnesium, the chance of that potassium getting up into the plant is much greater than magnesium getting up into the plant. And so it's really important to make sure that kind of the nutrients are in balance. And so if you're borderline magnesium, where it's enough, but not a whole lot, it's important to make sure you don't add way too much potassium because you actually would inhibit the uptake of magnesium into the plant. And so a lot of these nutrients have a balance within them some are actually synergistic of phosphorus and magnesium. They work together. Notice though on this chart, and I wasn't able to find one that had sulfur, <laughs> is that um, sulfur is missing from here because sulfur wasn't a nutrient of concern back in the day. And so no one has done a new one, um, unfortunately. But I would say definitely the key one is the nitrogen to sulfur ratio. It's 15 to one. So 15 parts of nitrogen, to one part of sulfur. Oops. Okay, so you, where do you start? Well, I would suggest first, take a soil test. Um, submit it to a lab of your choosing, whether that be um, the, your local university uh, or to another private lab to get kind of the baseline and understand what is there in your soil in the first place. Because if you don't know where you're, you're going, you, you're not gonna get there. Um, you need the map, so you need the soil test. Some soil tests will give you a whole lot more information. In general, in areas that it rains a lot, um, I generally don't necessarily suggest trying to pay extra for a nitrogen test because it's so dynamic that you measure it today and it's gonna be changed by tomorrow anyway. Um, but in general, the soil test is those other five macronutrients and, some, um, and the sum of the micronutrients, but not all of them. Um, boron is a tough one to do, so sometimes you'd have to pay extra for that. But knowing uh, first what you have for, the, the, for your roots to grow into and what's there, and then from there you will understand what's your cation exchange capacity, which is great because that will tell you how well your soil can hold on to nutrients. And if it's low, all is not lost because you can actually increase your cation exchange capacity by increasing your organic matter. Because um, that also does help. Now, one thing about organic matter and pH, which I 
failed to mention is that if you have a high uh, organic matter, meaning that it's say around 10%, you actually can get away with about 0.5% lower in the pH. And so you could have a 5.5 if you had a high organic matter would be similar to say a six. So you don't necessarily have to buy a bunch of lime and put it on if in fact you have a high amount of organic matter. Um, the other part is yes, do a tissue test. Really super, super important to, to do that, um, to understand now where you are within the season. Uh, and I, I know that there are some, some fairly quick turnaround tests to do um, the tissue test, but obviously you wanna do it early because by the time you see a deficiency within the field, it is too late to make an adjustment in general to help affect your yield within that season. Because by the time the human eye can detect something that's going awry with your plants, it is already affected and set them back. And so I am as guilty as that as anyone right now with my little garden that I started. Um, so another reference guide, many of you are probably familiar with this, is the New England Vegetable Management Guide that is kind of put together as a combination of the University of New Hampshire and multiple other um, extension agent universities or land grant universities around New England. And it has in it a wealth of information. And one of the things I really like about it is it has each of those vegetables that are in there. And it talks about what are the nutrient requirements for that? What, is, what nutrients does it need a lot of and what does it not? Um, as well as the pests and other um, management uh, practices that you need. But it is really great to be able to understand, well, you know, as a potato, it likes a pH of 5 or 5.5. It's tolerant for that. You don't want to have a pH of, you know, 6.5 for potatoes. Or you have tomatoes, they like a pH of 6.5. There we go. And so lastly, it's just the four R's of nutrient management for soil. It is understanding that you want to use the right source. So whether that be an organic form, whether that's fertilizer or cover crop and understanding how that breaks down and what that does to your soil. So if you're using your, um, you have a neighbor farmer who has manure, nothing wrong with that, but just understanding what that, what's in that so that you understand how much of something you are applying. Because a lot of times when you use the manure, you're, you're really applying it for the nitrogen. But understand that along with that comes other nutrients that are in there that may start to accumulate in your soil. And so on top of um, adding that, you want to, if you can, get a test of what's in that. But also, if you can't, just take another soil test the next year so you understand where you are again um, after you've added that. Putting it in at the right rate. Um, making sure you're doing that. I mean, I understand that there are guidelines now of certain things when you can add them so a lot of times like well if you're growing greens that are going to be eaten you got to add the nutrients in the fall which is then are going to leach and not be available <laughs> for the plants um and so uh putting it in at the right rate or making sure that you have some cover crop there or something else some organic matter that is breaking down slowly and releasing those nutrients into the plant at the right time, making sure that you don't put it in where it's right before rain, where all the nitrogen is just gonna be leached out. And then at the right place, putting it near the roots, getting it where the plant is gonna use it. So if you can get it down in the root zone instead of up on the top of the soil is even better because it helps that stay there ready for the plant instead of potentially volatilizing like nitrogen can. And so with that I have, um, finishing up the presentation. And if you have any questions, you can ask me anything. Thank you, Janelle. We did have some questions along sure. the way. I'm just going to read you uh, them in order of receipt mm -hmm. here. And from Patrick, uh, how stable is the sand silt clay distribution? Over time, do the smaller particles settle or migrate with water flow? Yes, they do. That they can, depending on the soil type, they can either go up or down. 
<laughs> as it has actually been shown that clay can can um, kind of rise up depending on if you're in a flooded condition or not. So it kind of depends on the situation. But in general, it's a really slow process. But as part of the weathering and soil, the clay slowly, uh, because it's small particle, can um, migrate out away from that. And which is the reason why near beaches you have just sand, because everything else has slowly been kind of washed away. Okay, and from Carol, uh, keep hearing regarding nitrogen in clovers being provided by clover to soils. If so, is there a best practice, best strain percentage on a landscape? Oh, um, yes. Clover. Well, clover is a legume, and legumes um, do this uh, nitrogen fixing. So they have a symbiotic relationship with a rhizobium bacteria. And um, first of all, you have to have that rhizobium bacteria in your soil. So if you were to say do a new area that had no legumes that were growing there before, it is not a guarantee that the rhizobium are actually there in the soil to make that relationship or not in the quantity high enough to really make a difference. And so you can grow clover, but that clover would also need nitrogen unless those rhizobium are there to make that symbiotic relationship. And so the rhizobium form actual nodules um, on the plant and they help to actually fix the nitrogen out of the atmosphere because the atmosphere is actually made up mostly of nitrogen, nitrogen gas, N2. And so these rhizobium are amazing at the ability to be able to take that nitrogen from the atmosphere, fix that, and actually give that to the plant in exchange for the carbon. So clover is just one of the few legumes. There's also hairy vetch, um, and I am at a loss. There's a couple of other cover crop types that um, can be used. So clover is, it's really important to kind of maybe, I would say, contact your extension agent because depending on the climate that you're in, like where we are down here, you would grow a different type of clover because you're not gonna get a whole lot of what's called winter kill. Whereas in New England, Red clover is one of the ones that is in a mix a lot because it'll grow all season or it'll grow in the fall, grows fairly fast, but it'll winter kill. So it will not be something that you have to try to till in or get rid of in the spring because it's still growing. Uh, and in general, where hairy vetch is one that you grow, sometimes it can winter kill, but it can also become an invasive weed because it can set seed. So it's like the roller crimper and making sure you terminate the crop at the right time. I have actually done um, some experiments with white clover uh, in, a, uh, in New England using that as a living mulch, which is probably what you're referring to, that it is living there allowing the nitrogen to be available to the plants, which isn't necessarily true. Because that plant, the clover, wants that nitrogen just as much as the rest of the plants growing. Um, and so that clover actually will keep that nitrogen for itself. It may, if a few roots die, that then nitrogen would be able to break down and be available for the plants that are also growing next to it. But that being said, you are fostering a really great biotic community. And there was some research in, in Japan looking at using a living mulch of clover with corn. And what they found was that the crops that they had the clover, but they added nitrogen and phosphorus to, that corn didn't, didn't do as well as the corn that was grown with the living clover, but they didn't add any phosphorus or nitrogen. And they believe the reason why is because the other organisms and the mycorrhiza that were in the soil actually made that nutrients available. <clears throat> so when you add nitrogen, you actually make the soil, soil biota lazy. And so the, so, the, so the plant's like, I'm not giving them carbon if I have nitrogen right here because I don't have to do an exchange. So I'll just go ahead and eat, eat the carbon myself, right? or eat the nutrients myself. But 
something you have to think about is if it's a living plant, it is also going to use water as well as the other nutrients. And so the thing with clover and why it's so great as a cover crop <laughs> is that when it dies, now all that nitrogen <laughs> that is in the plant, it's going to decompose and it's slowly going to feed the soil and then feed the plants that come afterwards. And so that's really where the benefit of a legumous cover crop comes from. So you either have an area where you're letting it sit for a year and you put cover crop to build the soil or maybe in between the rows. But of course, remember any living thing that's growing at the same time that you're growing your crop is also going to compete for the same resources. And so kind of remembering that's a balance that you might need a little bit more water essentially or other things potentially. So it's super complex and I am happy to provide my email if anybody has questions <laughs> to ask later. Okay, and we have a question uh, from Deb about uh, living near the ocean. She says, I have sandy soil. Should I simply grow plants that are good in sandy soil or should I augment to create a more balanced soil which is better for the planet? Augment, I say. There are Plenty of, so New England is made up of three, or not New England, North Carolina is made up of three different essentially growing zones. We have ones called the coastal plain and it's just sandy. It's sandy soil, but it is the most fertile soil. And um, so just because you have sand doesn't necessarily mean you can't grow in it because if you get a lot of rain, that's great. It's gonna drain. However, making sure that you are building that organic matter is super important. And um, knowing that you have to augment that with water more than you would if you were in a clay soil. So you can add some compost in there and it may take you a little while to build that soil up so it, it's going to hold on to the moisture. But that great thing about organic matters, it's like a sponge. It's gonna hold on to a lot of water that then can be available to the plant. But within that, or in the time as you're slowly building, I would maybe begin with plants that are more drought tolerant and more tolerant to sandy soils. And if you are near the coast, you also have to consider how much sodium is in the soil as well. Because if you have a high salt environment, some plants really don't tire, tolerate um, salt, but some plants do. And so just doing a little research and understanding which, which plants would fare better uh, in that and just experiment, I say, to, to kind of figure that out. Thank you. And from Joe, living on Cape Cod, certainly uh, concern is, an, is nitrogen runoff into kettle ponds. A couple are not so far from where I have a large garden. Any suggestions for nitrogen management? I try to use organic matter with slow release nitrogen. Well, that's um, a really great question. I say the slow release nitrogen is, is good because that does um, allow that to be slowly available for plants. Um, making sure you're, you're maybe at growing a cover crop too uh, in, in the fall uh, when you're done with your regular crop. Uh, allow that to kind of, one thing that's not only good about cover crops for the nitrogen, but it's also, it's taking up all the nutrients, its roots reach down into the soil and pull the nutrients up. And then as they break down, they're, they're right there available to the plants the next year. Um, and of course, you don't necessarily have to till to get, if you're in a small garden, one of the, the, the ways you can um, deal with a cover crop is maybe use some uh, black plastic or other things, kind of solarized kill. There's been some um, really interesting research in, in doing like tarps over a cover crop to kind of terminate the crop um, versus tilling it because when you till obviously you're, you're kind of disturbing the soil itself. Um, so on top of those two things, um, I really making sure you're rotating. Uh, so if you have a heavy feeder of nitrogen one year, maybe the next year in that area, maybe use something that's not so heavy of a feeder so that um, allows that nitrogen to kind of build back up a little bit in the soil, in the organic matter. Um, but really, uh, 
slowly throughout the season, putting it on when the plant needs it instead of hog wild, putting it all on at the beginning. And I think organic practices generally tend to do that anyway. Um, so I think you're probably already on the right path and it's just kind of tweaking uh, and understanding what kind of mixes, if you're using a cover crop, release more nitrogen than not, because certain um, cover crop, it's like if you do a single type of cover crop, whether that be hairy vetch or maybe you're using rye, rye grass, which is very popular in New England because it has uh, really nice long roots uh, and you can put it on kind of late and it grows really well. It has a higher carbon ratio, so it doesn't break down as quickly as say a hairy vetch, which has a, kind of a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so if you do a combination of those or kind of play around with different types of cover crop combinations, you kind of get this longer release of those nutrients over the season as they break down because the ones with the lower carbon to nitrogen ratio break down first and then progressively as the carbon to nitrogen ratio increases in a cover crop, then it's slower to break down. I hope that answered your question. At this point, I'd like to um, ask if somebody has another question to unmute themselves. Uh, Carol, I see you had a question uh, that may need some clarification about inoculated seeds. Ah, yeah. Okay, so um, that the reason why you would in inoculate them is to kind of make sure that those symbiotic either bacteria, in the case of rhizobium, there are a few others. Um, an inoculant is kind of, well, it's the newest miracle pill that they're trying to sell. And so not all inoculants are created equal, I'll just say. But you wanna make sure you have at least rhizobium because that one is for certain if you're growing a legume, you will have that relationship there available. And so if you just say put beans out and you don't have any rhizobium, because um, everyone's like, grow a pea or grow a bean, grow some legume, you'll have the nitrogen fixing. But again, if it's not available in your soil, which is why you inoculate the seed, so now it is there. But after about two, three or four years or so, and this is where being a geek and like digging in the soil and looking at the roots and looking for the little nodules, which you can easily see with the human eye. It's not hard. I mean, you can even dig the clover out of your yard if you want to see like how um, healthy your yard soil is and if the rhizobium is there. I mean, I, I, I do that. I'm like, whoa, cool. There's rhizobium. Okay. I don't have to inoculate because I have it here already. So adding it, if you're in a new garden spot, or somewhere where you're not quite sure if it's there and, it, and spend the money on the inoculant, but you don't have to do it if you already have it there in the soil already. And some inoculum that's being sold doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be working because soil is a very competitive environment. It's got a whole bunch of different organisms that are all trying to find their niche and it's all about competition. And so if you put some foreign thing into the soil it may not necessarily survive because something else will outcompete it. Um, but in the case of rhizobium, you're fine. That's that is would be okay. But certain like mycorrhizal fungi or um, arbusco arbusco mycorrhizae, um, those things that are like sold as these supplements to miracle pill stuff isn't necessarily going to stay and survive in your soil because it all does depend on the dynamics. But I say at least it's worth a try. Just don't break the bank. You know, try little things, experiment and do um, a comparison. Did that crop grow better than that crop? Okay, that worked. Now I can switch to that. I'm a big proponent of setting aside a little area, doing a little experimentation and seeing how it works because it varies by location to location. Thank question. you. And what are some of the good ways to move a heavy clay soil toward a better balance? Mm, that's where I am right now. I can make bricks with my yard. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's so clay. It's like I can form pots with it. So uh, one that I'm doing is I'm going up. 
I am just piling on organic matter on top of it and allowing the, I'm basically doing sheet mulching and going up and using a lasagna garden in my small plot that I'm at right now. Um, but I did learn the hard way, hard way if you go to Home Depot and buy a bag of their garden soil. Uh -uh. It has so much organic matter and so many wood chips in it. It tied up all the nitrogen and all my plants are like not getting anything. So <laughs> as a soil scientist, I'm still experimenting going, why? There's plenty of nitrogen in here. But um, with the clay, it's, it's really about one, find uh, a cover crop. I'm, I know I keep pushing cover crops, but um, something with a root penetration ability. So that is where ryegrass is really great. Ryegrass has actually been shown to have one of the strongest abilities of a root to break through like a hard pan. So in that case, those roots can get through that clay and allow it to break up a little bit, making some fissures in there. Uh, and as you get that organic matter in there, you get more biota, you get worm activity and other things like that. Slowly, it starts to allow other things to infiltrate and break up that clay. Uh, and so that's kind of one of the main things that you can deal with clay. I mean, I've heard green sand and gypsum are also two kind of supplemental products you can help to break that up a little bit. But tilling or anything like that, it may make it look dandy for a day and it rains and it turns right back into concrete. So no disturbance is the way to go with pretty much anything, especially with clay, and allow the microorganisms to do the job as well as some growing plant. It just takes a little time. So by maybe sheet mulching over and adding some organic matter and some maybe topsoil on top of that in a small layer, uh, you'll see that in a year or two underneath of that cardboard that you put down to make that sheet mulch, you'll see that in actuality, the roots are starting to penetrate through that and go down into that soil and start to churn that around. And so you don't have to till and it becomes much better. Janelle, you mentioned uh, green sand and somebody had a question about green sand um, and adding it to sandy soil. Hmm. That one, I'm not quite sure about. I would have to look that up. Um, I do know that uh, green sand does have um, some micronutrients in it that help. Um, so if you, with sand in general, that is um, kind of the problem with sand is that it hasn't broken down enough to allow a lot of nutrients to be available. So kind of the weathering process is, it starts from a big rock, it breaks down to sand, it breaks down to silt, and then it slowly breaks down into clay. Clay is what has most of those minerals available to it. And so the sand is the parent material. It'll eventually become nutrients, but it doesn't hold on to a lot of nutrients. And so green sand perhaps is kind of a way to deal with that um, as well. I have a question. Yeah. Um, can you talk about beneficial nematodes and, and you, can, you can buy them to add to the soil? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Sometimes a good idea. Yeah, I mean, if you have a problem with something that that beneficial nematode is going to take care of, um, but that's where you want to do your research and understanding, you know, what's the marketing? Is it just, hey, buy some beneficial nematodes and all your problems will be solved? That is or, the marketing. <laughs> right, exactly. But there are beneficial nematodes that have been used. Um, when I was an undergrad, I worked with uh, Dr. Alan Eaton, who some of you may know, uh, he was uh, the entomologist at UNH, and we, he was doing a study on uh, apple trees and um, the uh, plum curculio bug, which is a really nasty looking weevil thing. I had to go collect those guys, but our experiment was in looking at, and the calling moth was the beneficial nematodes that they had applied underneath the apple trees, because it had been shown that because they, the larvae of these winter over in the apples in the ground. Well, they drop off the apples down into the ground, they winter in the ground. And so they thought, well, what are beneficial nematodes will eat those larvae and then you can reduce the next year's crop of those pests. So understanding what that nematode is gonna predate on first before adding it, because don't add something if it's not gonna, if you don't have a problem, 
Um, and one thing that a lot of people don't know is that, and this is completely off subject, but I think um, might be worth mentioning is the, those Japanese beetles. If you ever see a Japanese beetle with a little white dot or more than one white dot on it, leave it. Because it has been parasitized by a, a wasp and mm -hmm. it will be eaten from the inside out. And what you want is more of those wasps, so you want them to hatch. So before whacking a Japanese beetle into a bucket of soapy water, look at its back. It's kind of like the tomato hornworm with the little white things off of it. Leave that, it's also good, because now you've helped create the army that will get rid of those nasty things. The you same thing there is. I don't know about the tomato hornworms, but I never knew about the Japanese beetles. Yeah, I was, we were out on a site visit and he's like, oh, that's, you know, and he, cause he's a naturalist and he said that, um, that if they have white dots, just leave them because that's good. And yeah, it is something that should be, it is now a, um, a natural predator to them, which will slowly reduce their numbers. And never, ever, ever put one of them damn bags in your yard, ever. Because it, it, what you want is you buy those bags and you give them to your neighbor. <laughs> if you have one you don't like very much. Because then they'll all go over there and they'll stay away from your property. <laughs> or grow hops. That's a good trap crop. So, Janelle, I'm going to put your um, email address in the chat if that's okay. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yep. And, and what is it? Um, so I will give you my personal email is chef, C-H-E-F. Janelle, J-A-N-E-L, dot Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, at gmail.com. And uh, will you be able to uh, make the slides available to the group? Yes, sure. Yep, certainly. Great. Well, I uh, really want to thank all of you and apologize for our, our slow start there this, this evening. Um, but I do thank Janelle for her... Um, rousing presentation uh, for all of us soil geeks. Really appreciate it. And um, we hope that you'll be uh, joining uh, some of the other NOFA workshops um, coming up this Friday and uh, over the next three weeks.